we were just speaking about this move to capture value in the service economy. And one of the points that Professor Jochen Wirtz made was that if you're an established business, you need to actually get closer to the customer. So what do you do if you're a product business or have been, and you want to move towards a more customer focused solution kind of business? Jochen? Yeah, this is a very difficult journey. I have so many of my clients, they come to me, tell me, please help me. I'm manu manufacturing this type of equipment. Cost competition is so tough. Margins are so thin. How can I go into the solutions business? Right. right? And then you paint a picture like the Rolls Royce power by the hour example, right? Please. Where 80% of their engines are not anymore sold or leased to clients, but they, Rolls Royce runs those engines on their customers' aircraft. Right. You're talking the aircraft engines the aircraft for the major airlines of the world. For United, for Air France, for Singapore Airlines, right? Okay. So they run them. And the power really is, I mean, you can ask, it was a 40, 50 year journey for Rolls Royce to go from leasing or selling engines to actually operating the engines because the risks are unbelievable. For example, when the A380 of Qantas, then the new engines, trend engine caught fire, the entire A380 fleet, uh, fleet was grounded. And it was, of course, Rolls Royce's liability for, for this. So you're running the engine, you take the risk, right? The, the airline rents the engine. You're not engine. selling the product and the no. parts anymore. You actually are responsible for the solution itself Absolutely. of effectively operating aircraft engines, power by the hour. Power by the hour, right? And the, the, the beauty is, I mean, look at the value propositions both for Rolls Royce and for the airlines. I mean, for Rolls Royce, it's quite simple. One dollar engine sales, there's another seven dollars in repair and maintenance over the lifetime of an engine. Right. And in the past, after the warranty is over, many customers go to a low cost alternative provider. Yeah, and Rolls Royce lost out of that revenue. Okay. Yes. So they capture now the entire lifetime revenue of that engine by running it power by the hour. Yeah. But they take on extraordinary mm -hmm. higher levels of risk. Absolutely, right? You may ask what is in for the airline. Yes? Mm. And power by the hour means, of course, no risk, yes, or lower risk. And the other is that the, the, the Rolls Royce can add a lot of value to the service now. So in the old days, if lightning hits your engine, yes, your engine coughs a little bit, and then you radio from Singapore to LA, or you have a, had a lightning strike, and then in LA, they bring Rolls Royce and spare parts and engineers to the tarmac. Then they do diagnostics and all of this. So if you're lucky, no delay. Uh, maybe it's a short delay. If you're unlucky, it's a longer delay. And if you're very unlucky, which rarely happens, you need an aircraft engine, right? You need a replacement aircraft. So then you call the hotel, you call the bus all company, the all the costs, yeah, you put yeah. passengers on, on, on competitor aircraft, right? Now with power by the hour, what happens? If lightning strikes happen, happened, uh, immediately a stream of data goes to Derby in the UK. And Rolls-Royce knows. Rolls and there immediately, they, the, the numbers start dancing on the screen. So the engineers do remote diagnostic of this engine. Most of the time, no problem, meaning no one even has to look at the engine in Los Angeles. If there is a problem, if it's a small problem, they already know before they touch down they what the what problem is. They know what it is, the parts are there, the engineers are there, yeah. the diagnostics are there. And no, no, no delay mm -hmm. for the airline. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even if the engine has to be taken out of service, I know eight hours, hours in advance. Right. Yeah, so I'm My replacement engine is already on the tarmac, whereas for each airline to have done that for themselves, it would have been impossible. Would not work. So I get a replacement aircraft to fly in, and instead of having a day of delay, I, I give them a meal Why did this take Rolls Royce so long yeah. to make this migration? What was so challenging, difficult about making this shift yeah. from the product to the solutions offer? I mean, it was a long journey. I mean, first was communications. Rolls Royce built its own satellite network to track engines put sensors and intelligence into the engines to allow diagnostic and so on, right? So was, there was a lot of technology involved, a lot of learning involved, and of course, a lot of risk. It's a lot of risk. Yeah. You're taking on the lifetime risk of that engine. And I mean, so you can see, for, uh, but we are not there on the value proposition. I say not, not finished. There's another core part of it. Now, with all the data, Rolls-Royce can do preemptive maintenance. Yes. So I know I need a four-hour repair of an aircraft, and I can see where will this aircraft stop over for five, six hours. So I now fix that part there and then without uh, putting this aircraft out of service. Right. Right? And that part is my part, Rolls-Royce, yes. because I'm providing power by the hour. I'm no longer, I've taken the liability away from the airline ah. of having to even 
be concerned about the well-being of all of their aircraft uh, engines. Absolutely. And the airline, of course, they love it because, yes, it's a bit more expensive, but my $250 million piece of equipment is much more utilized. Secure, yeah. Yeah. I don't have to pay such high service recovery costs in hotel and, and whatever for passengers being stranded. So my aircraft are more on time and so on, less delays. So airlines love it, yes. And you can see from, from a Rolls-Royce angle, even there's a complete alignment now of interest. Mm. So in the old days, if there's an engine out of warranty and there is a repair, right? if you think about the P&L for Rolls-Royce, yes, long term it's not nice if there are repairs. But short term, you buy from me labor, you buy from me parts, actually it's right. positive for the P&L. So it's completely the wrong incentives for Rolls-Royce if you think about it, yes? But today, if there is a problem, it hits my pocket as Rolls-Royce. My being Rolls-Royce, it hits my bottom line. I want to prevent the problem with preemptive maintenance. Absolutely. So you can see now the interest is completely aligned. So if engineers redesign an engine, you can be pretty sure they do a Pareto analysis, which four, five, six problems cost me 80% of all the cost and we design them out. So the intervals of servicing get longer, the reliability right, gets better, and so on. So there you can see all the benefits for, for the alignment of interests. And, and the final uh, a really nice sort of addition to it is, think about it, if you want to provide the service to United or to Air France or to British Airways or Qantas or, or Singapore Airlines, where do you have to have parts and, 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 and uh, engineers to offer this service? So if you service to Singapore Airlines, you are, have to be in Singapore and everywhere where Singapore Airlines fly. So they have to cover the network. Likewise for Air France, likewise for everyone else. So if you offer the service, you have to have pretty much a global presence. And the nice thing is who only has this global presence is only the really big players, which is Rolls-Royce, GE, and Pratt & Whitney to some extent. But all of the low-cost competitors, they tend to be local in China or right. in... Yeah? Right. So overnight, you cut out every low-cost competitor with a service. They can't offer this. They may get into the engine with a sensor and all of this because they're not... Or so it wouldn't be allowed to lock them out, yes? But you have to have that volume, that liquidity or that, that network density, if you will, to offer it. It's interesting when you say overnight, you can take the competition out. Yeah. And yet it was a very long journey yeah, you just, just narrated to actually get there. Yes. So let's move away from aircraft yes. industry for a moment and talk in a more generalized sense for a product firm that yes. wants to move more towards solutioning. Yeah. What are some of the key points? Yeah. I mean, the Rolls-Royce story uh, sort of paints that beautiful end result and picture yes. everyone wants to go to, right? How to get there is actually really tough. And I work with so many companies, they really struggle on what to do, right? And I always tell them, you can't go from selling gadgets to solutions. It doesn't work, right? Not but, overnight. But, yeah, the first step you have to do is you have to really get your what we call product lifecycle services right. And product lifecycle is everything from consulting, configuration, installation, training, maintenance and repair, and upgrades, and, and all of these services. So you have to become an expert on those and do these really well. Why? Then you learn to understand customers. You're closer to the customer in mm -hmm. customers' factories and mm -hmm. processes, right? You learn a lot more. You appreciate a lot more what it takes to operate these distributed operations and people in the field. And the other thing is nobody's going to buy anything from you if you don't get these basics right. Yeah? So step one is really do the basics right. Do your product life cycle services the really, really across well. Across the entire life cycle. Yes. Don't try to just be a piece of that chain. You'll yeah. be disintermediated. Absolutely, All yes. Right? Second step is what we call as, um, asset productivity services. Now you do repair and all of this fine, yes. But the question is, you know, the company is not really interested. Oh, it's broken. Now I come and repair it. Their customers are interested. Hey, make sure it doesn't break. Make sure it's up, right. up time 99.99%, right? So can you now go into the customer and say, look, I can help you to make sure that, that the productivity level of these assets is up and there and running. So now you, the, con the discussion before is, is parts and labor. Now, if you want to have 99% uptime is a very different ball game mm -hmm. than, than a Six Sigma type of uptime. Mm -hmm. So the discussion in terms of pricing and negotiation is very different now because now you do everything from analytics to, to preemptive maintenance to maybe even having an engineer on site to help you with things. 
but now, so it's, it's quite it's still a, a very concrete value proposition, which means I promise you this machine will be up 99.99% of the but time. But now you understand how your customer is harvesting value from the, having that solution, yes, not sir. just being a piece of their overall need. Yeah. So far, everything was focused on your own gadgets and machinery. But you can look at customer processes instead, right? Meaning, hey, you want to have a certain outcome. I'm part of that, but this is much bigger, right? Mm -hmm. So how can I come in and help you actually to try and configure this entire process better? Right? So then I'm not a part of it. I'm an enabler of the yeah, overall yeah. process. Yeah, but I wouldn't even, I mean, what, most of these are actually like consulting and auditing. Let's yeah. say if you're an aircon company, you could do an energy audit. So I come into your building and tell, yes, I sell you the aircon, install it, da, 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 do all of th those things. But I can also come and say, look, you know, have you thought about putting some films onto the windows to cut the infrared and the UV rays? Uh, why not have sensors in the rooms that switch off the aircon if, if nobody right. is Your in the utilization room? in the morning is higher than in the afternoon. Did you know that? Absolutely. So I, I come in and I tell, look, you can get the same output, fresh, clean, cool air, but at a 40% cost in ener energy. Yeah. So this is what we call uh, the process enhancement services. So I have mm -hmm. to do this better. And, and this is typically charged by the hour like a consultant. Now, if you combine the process enhancement, you do a great job there. You do a great job on part of life cycle and do a great job on, on asset productivity. You put this all together. You can say, hey, why can't I? You don't pay me anymore for the air con or for the cleaning or any of this. I take over cooling your entire building. Outsource the whole thing for, to me. Right. And now it is much more, we have a very different set of KPIs. Temperature, air quality, uh, uptime, and all of those. Right, right. But now I'm carrying a lot of risk, right? I mean, the cooler may break down, the whatever, many things, leakage. As the solution provider, not as a parts supplier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I like, for example, BASF, the, the German chemical company, yes. they went all the way to, to their client's car, car industry, they used to sell uh, liters of paint. Yes. Okay? Yes. Today they sell, they charge car companies buy car painted. Painted. So they do the painted. end, yeah, the ever yeah. car. So it's the, the, the paint is completely specified. The KPIs yep. are clear. Yep. And we get paid for how, by car output. Which goes yeah. back to our earlier segment, which is what is the car manufacturer actually providing, which will be the brand, the customer relationship, relationship to point of sale, etc. Yes, yes. So as I said, it's, it's, it's a long journey. Rolls Royce was 40, 50 years. It's not overnight. But having said that, if you are stuck in selling gadgets, you're going to be more and more and more commoditized. It will be harder and harder to survive. And to give you one industry I, I observed when I moved to Asia was business uh, was out the entire contract manufacturing industry. Yes. Fat margins because everyone wanted to outsource not enough capacity. Right. Today you're looking at minute margins because I mean uh, Apple goes to Foxconn to Flextronic and whoever says look can you manufacture this to me give me an offer. Cheaper right? and cheaper and cheaper. Cheaper and cheaper right. and cheaper. So you have no bargaining power. If you're, you're just the contract manufacturer, yes. you're not a solution provider. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas Apple is an yeah. example of a solution provider yes. for the digital lifestyle that we're enjoying today. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So, so you, you want to make money, you have to make sure you add value. Yeah, yeah. And that goes more and more into providing complete solutions for whoever your customers are. Very good, very good. Now, most of this interview has been around if you are a product-centric company, yeah. how do you migrate towards solution? Let's just add one more piece of a question here. If you're in a startup situation, you're an entrepreneur, and you want to get into some area, what advice would you give in this area of concern regarding products and solutions and the future? I always find it very funny. I have many people who want to deliver solutions for industries, but they look from the outside, they never understand quite the intricacies in this industry. Mm. So the successful mm. startups I have seen were people who are precisely in that inside. situation. They are inside, they understand what it takes, and then they come up with a solution. Mm. And then they usually leap, leapfrog technology. They immediately, on an, on, a, on an online platform, they immediately on Internet of Things, they immediately into, into analytics. So you do something where you throw away all the legacy and you really focus on the process. Given today's, today's technology, how would I do it, right? So this is for the startup, yeah? yeah? Right, and when you say do it, you mean how would I provide the value to the client organization? Yes, yes, yes. And for an established gadget manufacturer, right? I, same part, I mean, start slow. 
look at your product life cycle services first. And I just came back from a global conference, one of one, a very large manufacturing company. What we did with them is we asked them, look, you know, in every of your country organizations, you have already either your vendors or you, your, your units yourself, they provide services. Right. So, and everyone just does something different, yes? Why don't we develop an, an inventory of all the possible services you already have within the organization yes. and see which one of those are scalable on a global level? So as I, I, this is what I would do as, as a first step. Then they always ask me, how in the world can I charge? So if I've given these services for free, nobody want to pay for those, right? It says, yeah, overnight you can't do this, but I mean, one uh, nice way from moving, we call this from, from, fee, from free, free to, to fee, fee, is really to say, look, you know, base services are still free. But if you need advanced, so base engineering is free, but advanced we're going to charge, yes. right? So this is the first step. Yes. Uh, or you have a portfolio, look, there are seven, eight modules we offer. Three of them are for free, but if you need more, then we charge on the And we'll show you the benefit and the value of having the other four. Yeah, yeah. And, and one other option is what I find very effective is, look, you know, we, are still, we won't charge you, but we put it as an item on the bill and we discount that again. But we want to communicate the value we do, and then people get used to this is actually a component. And if you do this for two years, they almost expect that at some point this will not free be free anymore. And they're willing to pay for it because they've understood the value that's actually being delivered. Yes, yes, yes. Right. And last advice, really, when you want to move into solutions, yes. there's a lot of uncertainty both on the client side and the provider side. As you've clearly narrated, especially yeah. from the provider side. For both, for both, right? And a huge risk for both because for the customer, it is mission critical very often and yeah. for the provider, it's huge risks, right? And there's a leap of faith. And, and I mean, to me, it always means you have to work with a customer. You have really a good relationship. One thing it often pays is to, yeah, you can't specify everything in the contract up front, yeah, so you have to be open to and yeah. flexible. Yeah. And the other thing is what also helps is open book initially. I mean, to understand on both sides what are the costs and, and why why is there an overrun of 150% in this and uh, we can cut a bit here, that you build that trust over time. Right. And, and then you have two or three or four customers where you have done this journey after that, you know much better how to specify contracts, how to do KPIs, how to, pricing, how to cost how, it, how yes, to price it, yes, and, and so on. Yes. That would be my recommendation, how to go about it. Yeah, how to go about it. Yes. Shifting from a product-centric to a solution-centric offer to your customers in the growing services economy.